I'm David Blankenhorn. Welcome to the conversation. Really happy to have at the table with me tonight Linda McLean, professor of law at Boston University. Linda, welcome. Thank you, David. It's good to see you again. I've really been looking forward to this talk, uh, this conversation. One of the things I've admired about you is that, um, you know, we've often disagreed on issues. You've always been a very forceful advocate for your position, but you've been always a wonderful conversation partner and you've really sought out engagement with those with whom you disagree. And I, I've really admired that. So it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. You grew up in Ohio. Yes. And you went to Oberlin. Yes. And then you went to the Uni University of Chicago Divinity School. Yes. Where in both places you studied a lot of religion. Mm -hmm. Now, did you plan or think at one time that you might go into religious studies or religious work as a profession? Um, religious studies. Yeah. Um, not religious work. Yeah. I was interested in history of religion and comparative religion. And then you switched to law. Yes. In Georgetown yes. and NYU here in New York. Yep. And then you worked at a fancy law firm for mm -hmm. a while. And then you began teaching. And you've taught at a number of places, but most, most of the time spent uh, first at Hofstra University and now currently for the last four or five years? This is the sixth year. Six yeah. year sixth year at Boston University, mm -hmm. professor of law. And uh, you think of yourself as a political progressive. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that term means, but I'm certainly liberal and probably somewhat progressive. Feminist, I mean, liberal, feminist, progressive are all terms I feel comfortable with. Liberal, feminist, progressive. I mean, those three terms, right. not necessarily all Yeah, 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 I understand. Some comedy. Right, okay. right. Right. I was talking the other day with uh, Kinji Yoshino, and mm -hmm. he said that he thought he was politically progressive, but that he had a conservative temperament, by which he meant that in politics and in philosophy, he was clearly left of center, but, you know, he, he said, I'm never late for anything. I, I'm very uh, complete, com complete commitment to the work ethic, uh, you know, a kind of a conventional appearance, of, you know, there was, so he, he thought he had a conservative, conventional, sort of bourgeois temperament with being politically and philosophically left of center. Does are, that make are conservatives claiming ownership of the work ethic now? <laughs> no, I'm just asking you if that makes sense to you. Um, well, I mean, I think the... For you, I'm asking you. It's interesting to think about what conservative means, because as you know, David, I've written about values for a long time. Our first encounter was work Jim Fleming, my husband, and I did, who's also a law professor, about civil society at a time when your institute was working on it. And so I've spouted the language about seedbeds of virtue for quite a long time, and I believe in it to a, to a pretty strong degree. I think we differ sometimes on how we uh, apply that, but I, I think I'm a responsible person. I embrace basic values, but no, I don't think don't, that's a conservative, no, 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 no. I'm not exclusive I'm not, I'm not trying to, realm. This, this, is, this is not a culture <laughs> right. war question. I was just interested that he would right. say, and I think it's a growing category, right. because conservatives used to say, used right. to think, many still do, being a liberal was meant a kind of loosey goosey, oh. break a rule, uh, you know, oh. uh, bend a rule. Whereas uh, Yoshino was saying that he was politically progressive, but he felt that his sort of demeanor, his life, had a was conventional, rule oriented, deferred gratification, hard work, and so on. I'm not trying to make a culture war point. I'm trying to talk about a kind of a just a I think it's a growing category of people, and I don't. In other words, if I'm doing anything, I'm criticizing the, cons the maybe older conservative idea of liberals that said, you know what I mean? Does that make right. Sense? Well, I've spent a lot of my career trying to defend liberalism against all sorts of these attacks. Attacks. All right. All right. <laughs> and, no, no, no. Uh, it's sort of thinking liberal theory can be blamed for just about everything. So I, you know, I come out of the political liberalism tradition, like John Rawls, who, if there was ever 
a respectful, virtuous person, it had to be him. So, sure. I mean, I, I don't exactly okay. know right. what All right, all right. But, you know, I think that uh, if, if you're asking me, is a commitment to preserving important institutions, to preserving important values, Important to me, yes, it is. Does that make me a conservative? I think conservatives and liberals have common ground on lots of right. things, right. as evidenced by the conservative brief for same-sex marriage. Right. right, right. Now, I want to explore with you for a minute this notion of liberal feminism and what might be called a communitarian critique of liberal feminism. Okay. As you know, sometimes these critiques have come from within the liberal tradition. I'm thinking of someone like uh, Bill Galston, whose work mm -hmm. you know well. Right. And sometimes they've come from without. And you're very familiar with the basic nature of the critique, that the liberal emphasis on autonomy, seeing largely a society of autonomous individuals, tends to blur and downplay the importance of relationships and uh, institutions, and that at the level of values, the liberal emphasis on the values of care and fairness, which are very elevated in the liberal pantheon, tend to obscure and downplay other aspirations for human excellences that may revolve around issues of say, authority, or loyalty, or sanctity. So there's a kind of a communitarian critique of liberalism, sometimes from within the ranks of liberalism, and sometimes from without. And I know that a lot of your work has been wrestling with exactly this. So I would like you to just sit, situate us on how you understand these, how, how are you friendly to a communitarian critiques of this nature? Are you yourself someone who makes these kinds of critiques? Or do you say, no, I don't, I want to reject these arguments? Um, well, I guess I should mention that Jim and I just wrote a book called Ordered Liberty, Rights, Responsibilities, and Virtues. So we try to update some of our early work on communitarianism and show uh, that there is an approach to liberalism, Bill Galston's a good example, uh, that is concerned about civic virtue and is coming from a strong feminist perspective, uh, concerned about care, um, uh, concerned about relationships, and also concerned about uh, well, what we call ordered liberty. It's not liberty as license, okay, uh, which would be kind of the critique of liberals, it's, it's, like, it's like a teenager saying, this is America, I can do whatever I want. You know, I do what I want. I mean, this is what we hear sometimes at home. I do what I want, you know. I mean, that's not an adequate account of freedom because freedom has to be tethered to responsibility. And these are basic categories. And so I think what I've tried to do in my work is try to resist caricatures or reductive pictures of communitarianism as well. I mean, the big fear of communitarianism has been it's just authoritarian. And, and Amitai Etzioni worked hard to show responsive communitarians are respectful of individual rights. And you know we may have differences about to what extent rights should be curtailed um, you know, out of community values. I mean, I think Etzioni, I think, is probably ardently championing gun control right now. And many conservatives, unfortunately, are not. But um, yeah, so I, I think that. Um, there are some versions of liberalism that I'm uncomfortable with, but I've tried to embrace uh, a version of liberalism that uh, recognizes that people are situated in relationships, recognizes that communities are important, uh, recognizes that um, civil society um, helps to form people, and there's an interplay between the state and civil society. And, and it's not just kind of liberty means the freedom to do whatever I want, Without the you know, without any concern for the consequences on anyone else. Right. I mean, even Mill didn't embrace that kind yes. of view on liberty. Mill yeah. was very strict about if you do something that um, harms the rest of society, then that's that's no longer the realm of liberty. Right. So, well, you did a wrote a very important book in two thousand six called The Place of Families. Thank you. Harvard <laughs> Press. 
Um, and I first met you, I believe, around an issue of the uh, Chicago Kent Law Review that you organized back in 2000, where you were offering, you gathered together some reflections, some critical, some just evaluative of the sort of civil society idea. Mm -hmm. Would that be fair to say? Yes. In a nutshell, why did you want to, what were you trying to argue here in 2000 about the idea of strengthening civil society and has, is your view pretty much the same now that it was then or has it evolved? Or? Um, Jim Fleming and I did that and I think Jim would say that we have become more pro-civil society than we were in 2000. I think back then we were... The, study, the subtitle of your essay in this was Questions for right. Civil right. Society Advocates and you basically argued, uh, uh, you basically said look you may be overselling this. There may be some things you're overlooking, and here they are. Right. That was our essay was structured as questions because we were concerned about a tendency to think that the decline in civic virtue and in civil society somehow was related to gains in equality, the civil rights movement, various groups had been disadvantaged, questioning their position in society, and it seemed like. Um, it seemed like there was this, what we call a strange moral accounting that, you know, on the one hand, it's good that they had the civil rights movement. On the other hand, we have teen pregnancy. And we just said, wait a minute, what does one have to do with the other? So some of it was just trying to get clear on things. Another thing, and I think that a lot of people still struggle with, is the notion that institutions of civil society, like the family, like voluntary associations, like PTOs, if you will, parent-teacher organizations, um, are seedbeds of virtue that help oh, there's support a good phrase. right that <laughs> help support our political order assumes that and I'm going to use a technical term there's a congruence between the values and virtues in a particular realm of society and the values and virtues at the level of our democratic political order. Now, there's a tension that your people recognized back when you worked on the report you did, and Bill Galston did the report he did. I know he signed both reports. These two reports right. that the Institute for American Values did and that Galston and colleagues did right. were the basis yes. for your yes. symposium that evaluated and critiqued these reports. Yes. Yes. So, so both of these groups, especially the group Bill Galston was working with, recognize that no you know it's very difficult to sort out you know can we really say that you know participation in bowling leagues or folk dancing or right. you know cleaning up your neighborhood directly makes people better citizens more respectful of others you know more tolerant more committed to you know core democratic values and this problem of congruence um, was one that they said, we don't really know the answer. Right. Because there's another idea that is also very important, and it relates to some of the debates about the family and parenthood and marriage today, which is in our, in our society, we believe that religious groups, you know, families, um, voluntary groups, are sources of their own independent values. And even if they don't support the political order, they're important, and we don't want the state to insist that they're only worth protecting if the way they see the world is exactly the way this, you know, uh, our democratic political order sees the world. So, for example, you know, the Amish, it's the most famous example, are allowed to take their children out of the high school because they're part of a kind of somewhat insular society. But the court said they're, but they're good citizens. They don't depend on the state. They're, you know, they, they're responsible. No one's ever been until well, we've had some problems recently, but they don't cause a lot of problems, you know? And, and conversely, like if an Orthodox Jewish family uh, doesn't embrace uh, the same kind of values that, um, you know, uh, the American uh, political order embraces in terms of a strong commitment to sex equality, to, you know, not saying the sex... Are you pointing these qualities out as problematic, or are you I'm celebrating? Just saying, no, I'm saying these are examples where you might think, you know, if it, what does it mean to be a seedbed of civic virtue? Does it mean that you have to have exactly the same no, values, or having, does it just no, mean that having having right. created, so there's a tension? There's yes. a tension about how Absolutely. these groups support the political order. Some people say 
because there's all these diverse groups doing their own thing, adhering to their own values, in the aggregate, that supports our pluralistic political order. But then some claims, including some of the claims I think were made back at the time of those reports, is that somehow it's in families that we learn these democratic skills that make us good citizens, that you can translate what you learn in the family to how you become a good person. The good, the, here's it. The good person is the good citizen. The good person is the good citizen. The good neighbor is the good citizen. Versus, you know, I may have a very different vision of what I think it, we would know, have argued yeah. in our, our group, we would have argued that the that family life for good or for ill is what shapes character and competence. Right. Empathy, <clears throat> altruism, the ability to care for others, the ability to be responsible. The, and you make some of these, many of these arguments right. yourself. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, why have you become, why in the last 13 years have you become, as you said, maybe more pro the civil society argument? Um, <clears throat> Well, I think I've been a parent longer. <laughs> I've been part of communities longer. Um, you have teenage children. Oh well, yeah. yeah. I have teenage children, um, so I see, you know, the importance of trying to. I see the different institutions that do shape character because, you know, we're doing things at home. They're engaging with their classmates in discussions about. American history, about world history, about government, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what do you learn from the past. Um, I see all these things going on. And I think also I, I appreciate, um, I've come to have a better understanding of uh, what I would say were just tensions about civil society mm -hmm. that are very hard to resolve. They're, yes. they're built into our constitutional order. Yes. And and they, they bubble up in some very difficult ways, like should a group get an accommodation from an anti discrimination law. But I think Jim and I have just become more um, more mindful of how important all the formative activities are that take place in these different parts of our society. Yes. You know, clubs, families, religious groups. Schools, yes. schools are public. So, I mean, public schools are not sure. technically not civil quite. society, but yes. but schools are kind of yes. an institution where a lot of formation yes. goes on, for better or worse. Yes, yes. Well, I've I've been a fan of civil society in part because of this very notion of the pluralism that is Im embodied in these uh, kind of intermediate organizations, and um, so. Well, and, and can I just say one sure. more thing? And I think when I wrote Place of Families, I was trying to make sense of how, this sounds kind of silly, but how does everything fit together? You mm -hmm. know, what is it that we look to families to do in society? What do we look to government to do? What do we look to these other groups to do? And A continuation, really, of right. questions you were raising in the civil society argument right. with special emphasis on families. Right, because every political, every presidential cycle, there's always rhetoric that, you know, strong families uh, undergird a strong nation. Democratic, Republican, it doesn't matter. You're going to have rhetoric about why families are so important. But families can't do it all by themselves. And that's why the infrastructure of society, I mean, you and I were talking before this started about inequality. And if people in different families live in different communities with different resources, and you know some are much more fragile than others, now I sound like Marianne Glenn and ecosystems. You know, yes. the way in which the experience people have de depends a lot on yes. the resources that are available to them, what sort of opportunities they have. You know, and and that's as well the family as alone can't do all that. Yes. The family alone can't do it, right. but the family is also an important, independent, somewhat, not not isolated, but right. uh, its own source of outcomes and and for people. In, in other words, it's not it's not not just an epiphenomenon. It's not just derivative of larger forces. It has its own uh, it has its own uh, well place. Let's say. <laughs> Let's go to a little bit, before we talk about specifically marriage as a public issue, I want to do a little bit of a, a lightning round. I'm going to ask you five or so questions. Give me, you can give me quick answers along the lines of strongly agree, strongly disagree, or somewhere in the between. Okay, here goes. 
unwed childbearing is not a good idea. It's not best practice. What's the age of the person that's doing the unwed childbearing? What are their economic situations? I have to just you, give a general answer. You know answer. nothing more than what I've told you. Um, what are my options? Strongly disagree, strongly agree? Or anywhere in between. I'd probably be a three on that because I need to know more about what the circumstances are. You're in the middle. Not sure. I, I need I, this. I need answer. to know what the picture I'm looking at is. All right. Here's a picture. Here are two <laughs> ads. Put it, if Andy, you can put them up on the screen. This is these uh, New York. These are these ads that are now appearing all over New York City in subways and schools, and they're against teen pregnancy. Yes, I'm. So, I'm not in favor of teen pregnancy. So the idea is. <laughs> <laughs> I will emphatically go on the record. If anyone is home at listening to this, I am not in favor of teen pregnancy. Okay. Here's one ad. Please edit that out. If you finish high school, get a job, and get married before having children, you have a 98% chance of not being in poverty. Think twice before you have it. And here are these unhappy children on the side. And here's the second one. Here's this unhappy young child says honestly mom chances are he won't stay with you what happens to me I don't like that Ed. the first one is better I don't care for the second one to say a little bit more about what you like and don't Can like I just about these ads well first of all although teen pregnancy is a problem we both know that more unwed parenthood is taking place in the 20s, right? Of course. And so, and that's really what people are more concerned about is like, why are so many people in their 20s not? These know, are ads in right. schools and right. aimed at teenagers. Right. right. I, look, I in in place of families, I have a chapter about how do you teach reproductive and sexual responsibility to teenagers, and I take a position in favor of um, abstinence plus or comprehensive sex ed, which is message about abstinence, but also teaching about contraception. And, te and so on the one hand, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, I think, yes, teen pregnancy is a concern. It's not like the old days where uh, an 18-year-old who got pregnant, uh, that was often the prelude to, to marriage. We don't live in the era of the shotgun wedding anymore. Uh, we don't live in the 50s where brides like my mother were younger. Agreed. You I'm know? just asking you to talk about these ads. <laughs> um, do, do I think you, these you are good you, things? You don't, like the, you don't like the second one because it well, says... Well, it's too personal to one mother. I mean, it's saying, Mom, you've screwed up, you know. Um, uh, right. I, I think this one saying, statistically, this is... Uh, if you could just do these... This is what they've been saying for 20 years. Finish high school, you know, get a job. This is the Isabel Sawhill, Ron Haskins, and plenty of other people. Right. The so-called su success sequence. Right, if right. You, Although I think that... Um, from what I understand, that you're more expert on this than I do. Now, what we want to tell people is finish college before you. I mean, isn't that the story that the State of well, the Union reports talks about? That it's the Americans that have a high school degree, but don't get a college degree, that are more likely to be separating parenthood and marriage now. Well, that is certainly true. Right. Yes, and we. we I want to talk about that in a right. moment. So it, here's the thing that people said back. Um, back in the 90s. But it's definitely still true well, that I, if you graduate well, from high school, get well, a job, and get married before you have You know, you I'm not a children. social scientist, but I can remember debates even back in the late 90s saying, so what if these women do what you're telling them to do? They do finish high school. Uh, they do get a job. They marry the person. Are they really going to not be in poverty? It really depends, doesn't it, on what kind of a job they can get. Well, the best <laughs> research suggests that if you do these right. three things, the chances of being in poverty, either for you or your children, right. are significantly less right. than five percent. Right. If you don't right. do any of these three things, the chances of you and your children experiencing poverty are more than eighty percent. Right, right. So I'm I am in favor of trying to persuade teenagers not to get pregnant. But and you don't like the second ad because you think it's too stigmatizing or too... Well, why isn't it focused on the guy? Well, Honestly, there, there mom. Are, there I mean, are. There know, are uh, ones that... I just happened to show you right. the one that's focused on females, but there are others that focus with just as sharply on the guys. Right. The reason I'm asking... Here's the reason I'm asking. I'm still 
when I'm, pr I'm probing a little bit on this issue of uh, your and you and I know it's not quite fair to make you a stand-in for all liberal feminist thinkers, but okay, so your Linda McLean liberal feminist viewpoint about the place of families, I'm 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 just kind of probing a little bit on a couple of the the key difficult questions, right. and one of them being unwed childbearing. Right. Right. Um, so could I just share I'm with trying, you? I'm a, trying to press to see what your level of... Um, okay. I'm just going to share with you a few ideas. This is from Bill Clinton when he announced the creation of the National Cam Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. We have to work to instill within every young man and woman a sense of personal responsibility, a sense of self-respect, and a sense of possibility. Marion Wright Edelman, the best contraceptive is a real future. Dr. Henry Foster, we are culpable as a society when we allow a 13-year-old to feel her only vision is having a child. So I'm all for helping young people have better futures, helping young people not believe what's the difference if I have a child now versus when I'm 27. My life's not going to get any better. As someone said in the book, uh, this book that I wrote, why wait? Nothing's coming. I mean, what's going to be different? You know, so that I feel very strongly that you should help young people feel they have a sense of possibility. That it, and also the responsibility message. You shouldn't be becoming a parent unless you're ready to be a parent. Now, they may not share my assessment of whether they're ready or not, right? But adults do have a role in explaining to young people, you know, what the prerequisites are for being able to be a responsible parent. It's not just a means test, right? Be, because you could be relatively poor, but still a very good parent. But it's more like, are you really capable of the responsibilities of being a parent? So I'm, I, I don't my, think liberals my. or feminists uh, would, 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 would blindly embrace any choice any girl made. Okay, if there's a lot of feminist these work ads, on these, these ads challenges. These ads were created right. by liberals. Right put in the schools yeah. by a liberal right. administration right. and have been very strongly criticized right. by many liberals as being too much finger pointing and too much blaming. Okay. All so, of the above are right. true. So, so here's the thing. In the last few months there have been a lot of prominent news stories about class inequality to the point where you know, children of well-educated, fairly affluent parents know about elite colleges, know about good universities, they get guidance counselors who encourage them to apply to these universities, children in less advantaged communities, people don't know anyone who went to a really good school, they don't understand the value of going to a really strong school. People say, why don't you just go to the community college, why don't you just go here? So can we talk about that kind of inequality and how we might have social programs that try to address class inequality that's shaping the choices people make and the opportunities they think they have because I think in that addition to or instead we can of talk telling about people this, to behave but I, I would like to know what else they're doing right now to help these young people okay I got it next next develop one. a sense yep. of possibility All right. I, I'm with you, you. Know? I'm with you All right. <laughs> here's the second one <clears throat> a person should have the right to end his or her marriage at any time and for any reason <laughs> that she or he chooses? Um, well, that's, you mean like no fault divorce? Um, well, that, to the extent that we've adopted no fault divorce, that is the current state of family sure. law, except that you have to, George, a judge has to find that there's been irretrievable breakdown. But some people say, if one party insists the marriage can't be continued, then, you know, that's, that's, uh, they have the legal right to do that. I think that as a society, we could try to work toward helping people try to learn a little bit more about how to have yeah. a successful marriage, maybe at the front end when they're entering into marriage. Right. I support marriage education. Yeah. You know. Okay. So, a child should have the right, as far as possible, to know and be cared for by his or her biological parents. Um. I can't agree with that as written because there's a trick in there about assisted reproductive technology, right? 
So it's, if you tell me as far as possible I'm means... I'm quoting from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Right. Okay. I support that, but not an interpretation that means, therefore, we shouldn't have assisted reproductive technology. I embrace that idea if we understand... Embrace what idea? That yeah. a child should have the right to know their parents yes. and be cared for their parents. What I'm, what I'm resisting is the biological, because as you know, there's different pathways to become a parent, including adoption, or... No, no, we're not... Well, right. well, let, let me hear that. Will you read it to me again? A child should have the right, right. as far as possible, yes. to know and to be cared for by his or her biological parents. I agree with everything in that, um, except if biological means you're in a war-torn country and you're trying to reunite families, I agree with that. If it means that this means people shouldn't be allowed to use anonymous sperm to have a child, I don't agree with I, I don't agree with that interpretation, that okay. statement. And on the issue of third-party participation in procreation through sperm donation right. or ga gamete donation or through surrogacy, do you believe that that practice is ethically problematic because it, in some senses, uh, raises the question of denying the child access to one of his or her biological genitors. Is that an ethically problematic practice for you in that respect? Um, I, I think that I support the move toward um, premising donation on consent to letting a child learn their donor at an appropriate time. Um, I, I do understand that young that people have a, this desire to know who they are and what their identity is. I don't think that's a reason not to permit people to have children through collaborative reproduction or assisted reproduction. But I do believe people, some countries have moved toward a regime that would allow donors and re children can see through terminology, donor, you know, yeah. whatever, to know each other or to you know even learn live and even eat, meet each other if that's desired and what, Naomi Khan who you may know of course um, and she'd be great to have in this series well, also she, uh, we're hoping to do that yeah, for just this time. has written all about this issue of kids want to know their half siblings you know they right. want to form kind of relationships uh, having said that I, I I I think Naomi would agree that there's a sort of scary, brave new world quality, or some people have said the Wild West, to ART where it's just, it's, it's, it's very underregulated. And even though there are ethical norms that the Society of Reproductive Medicine tries to promote, you shouldn't have a sperm donor fathering 150 children. Right. We all hear these stories, you know. Yeah. This, this, is, this is an area that needs more regulation. Reflection and regu right. props regulation. Exactly. Okay, in general, the two-parent married couple home appears to be the family form that is best for children. Do you say on average? Do you say in general? I say in general, okay. but I'm happy to say on average. Okay. On average, the two-parent married couple home appears to be the family form that is best Wait, for children. I, I agree with that statement, on average. Okay. Last one. A person should have the right, as far as possible, to have a child. Um, I think we've all, actually, I think we've answered it, but maybe you don't. I think we've answered it. Do you mean right in terms of government shouldn't put obstacles in their path or government should fund them? I mean, what does the right mean here? We, you're talking about I'm thinking ethically. I'm not really, I'm sorry. It, talking to a lawyer, right. but I'm thinking, I was thinking in terms of, 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 of rights understood as ethical, uh, ethical goods. In other words, do you think, it, does the person have, does, in your view, ethically, does a person have the right to have a child? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Mary Lyndon Shanley, or Molly Shanley, I guess is what she goes by at Vassar, um, has talked about the right to family as a pillar of citizenship. Like Judith Schlar talked about the right to vote and the right to earn, and Molly has sort of said the right to family 
is like a third pillar. Of course, the UN Declaration right, right. grants a person the right to marry yes. and found yes. a family. Yes. That's so the formulation. And so I support, I think that's a human, I think human family formation and intimate relationships is, is at the level but of you see, human you right. see where I'm going. I'm going at, I'm trying to probe a little bit on this issue of an individual says, I want to be a parent. Okay. And there is no good or rational reason for society, either through social disapproval or through legal regulation, to deny me that right. No, I, I don't. Social disapproval is something different than having a legal entitlement to do something. This is the whole communitarian point about raising the moral voice. I mean, I think people are justifiably um, agitated and, and upset when you hear of these kind of extremes, you know, where someone lies about their age and gets implanted and becomes a mother at 60, you know, and now men, of course, because reproductive different for them, old geezers can do that. Famous movie stars can do it with young wives and well, you know, I'm think, let's, let's take a, I'm just thinking but, of a more prosaic example. Right. But I mean, you know, could we raise our moral voice? Like, why is a 75-year-old man fathering a child he's not going to be around to see graduate from high school? I mean, good, good should we point. raise a okay. moral voice against him? And your you know? answer? Well, I mean, if you're going to raise it against, you know, whoever else you have in mind, I mean, I think we ought to sort of. Well, if we're going to pick more. on these teenagers, maybe right. we should pick on these old rich guys, too. That <laughs> well, it's not just that, but I mean, look, reproductive technology, I mean, there are, there are added costs involved. There are added risks to children. There are expenses, and I think it is an area that calls for some ethical, you know, sensitivity. I mean, just because you have a right to do something, this is Bill Galston says, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, right? And so yes. sometimes we need to think. But some of these are very challenging questions. Does a person who knows they have cancer, uh, is it wrong for them to want to have a child and experience parenthood, even if they won't be there the child's whole life? Or is it is it a very important thing for them and for their loved ones that they do this? I mean, well, let's go back to things, a much know. more prosaic example. You and I both remember the famous Murphy Brown right. brouhaha right. back in 1992, Two. Yes. where a television character who was well-educated, professional woman, uh, economically uh, independent uh, but unmarried decided on her own to have a child and there was now this is a fictional character right. but let's right. say and there was a huge debate about it and you wrote about right. it and everybody right. talked about right. it but let's say now it's 2013 and the question is uh, a single m male or female economically independent simply wants to have a child. Yeah. That's it. Yes. No spouse underfoot. And Linda McLean says what? I think that's okay. It's okay. But can I just point out that Murphy Brown, as I recall, the impregnator was her ex-husband, and I think it was accidental, and he didn't want, he didn't want the child. And so Dan Quayle's office got into hot water and then had to say Murphy Brown uh, exemplifies pro-life values because well, she didn't abort the fetus. Well, okay, look, so anytime you get into an <laughs> argument with a fictional character right. on television, and, and, and trying to... The White House watched the final episode with a bunch of single moms and, and the White House said, Single mothers are the true heroes. So this was a great cultural moment. But 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 okay. So the, the part of the problem you're asking me is you're saying is it right to have a child knowing you're not going to have a second parent, right? I'm asking to be a little more okay. blunt about okay. it. Okay. Okay. I'm and let's we could ask it in the case of men, but I'm going to ask it now in the case of women because we're on to the Murphy Brown. I'm saying a talented capable, financially independent woman in her 30s yes. with no spouse decides that she wants to have a baby. I, Mr. Mean Guy, says that is a morally wrong decision. Okay. You say 
I disagree with you. You disagree, yes. disagree with me. You say, yes. more power to you, sister. I wouldn't put it that way. I'd say that if she wants to be a parent and she can be a capable, nurturing parent, why can't she be a parent? The reason that it's wrong is because she's denying the child the right to have a father. And if there's one thing that woman can never be and will never be to that child, no matter how capable she is, is she will never be that child's father. Okay, so David, now I have to ask you, I thought you had come to take the view that same-sex marriage no. was okay. <laughs> yes. And that's not going to, you have two women, they're never going to have a father there. So I'm confused now about, are you saying that gender complementary is so, gender complementary is so important that every child must have one dad and one mom? And if that's the case, then I don't understand how, you, how we can think it's okay that a same-sex couple can co-parent. Well, is that morally wrong for them to do that? That's a very fair question. Okay. When I was opposed to gay marriage, I would have offered that as my one of my main reasons for being opposed to it, as you know. Right. And I have now changed my position and support gay marriage right. for a range of reasons, which maybe we'll talk about a bit later. But um, I will just say that this is an aspect of it that continues to trouble me. And I don't know how to make everything all neat and orderly and perfect out there. Um, I, I do believe that if we want to look at gay couples, gay and lesbian couples, most of the children of those couples are in those relationships by virtue of previous heterosexual relationships that have ended. So it's a form of kind of re almost blended families. Although that's changing. Well, and this, it, right. it's, the composition may be changing, but right. the numbers are still mostly this. Right. The second is adoption, and the third, and by far the smallest, is through assisted reproductive technology. Right. Right. Ethically, when I look at the first group, I see reconstituted families, and I think about that pretty much the way I would think about it if it was heterosexual. Mm -hmm. In the second category, adoption, I think of it uh, as these children who have already lost their parents through, through a tragedy need loving homes, and it seems to me that gay couples can do that. I mean. That's good that gay couples as well as straight couples are willing to adopt kids that need homes. The third category, which is the smallest category, and the one that your question pushed back to me raises, right. I do find it very ethically troubling, still, as a supporter of gay marriage, because I find it problematic to say, I am going intentionally, for my purposes, to bring a child into the world who I know can never have a father. Okay, so I think this is a really fruitful identification of basic differences. And I'm saying this as a supporter I understand. of gay marriage. I understand. If I could, and I'll tell you what, all my conservative friends who are mad at me for changing my position, right. this is why they're mad. Okay, so so bef on the train down here today, I reread the so called conservative brief for same sex marriage, the Melman brief. And what they say on these issues is there's simply not a compelling reason to deny same-sex marriage. And to the extent that you say it's because you have to have gender complementarity in parenting, we disagree. They say, you know, evidence-based arguments suggest that gender is irrelevant to child outcomes. Sexual orientation is irrelevant, irrelevant to child outcomes. And so I think where you and I really seem to have a divide here is you believe deeply that children have to have one male, one female parent, the mother and Does the father. Does it matter to you personally that you had a father? Is that a meaningful datum in for your life? Um, in other words, <laughs> there, I'm looking at Linda McLean. 
And if I saw a picture of your father, if he were here right now, I might see a physical resemblance. And the idea that this is a man who, through a sexual relationship with a woman, produced you bodily, biologically, and there was a relationship that followed, this isn't a meaningful datum in terms of the deepest your deepest identity and the deepest um, sense of your life journey? This isn't like about as deep as it gets? The fact that from his body and her body came you? This particular individual man, flawed or unflawed, and this particular individual woman, flawed or unflawed, they had sex, you got made, and then a relationship between, among the three of you ensued? This isn't like pretty damn meaningful? Well, David, I'm, I'm trying to say that um, attachment between parents and children can take place whether or not there's a biological connection to the child no, but in or your not. Case, you know, in your I don't case. want to talk about my father right now, okay? 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 okay. Because, I don't know if my father will ever watch this tape, but my parents divorced. My mother raised five children with very little help from my dad. Uh, my father was gone much of my life. I have a very good relationship with him now, and I, maybe this will be edited out, but I really think that when you push that button with me, you're not making a very persuasive argument, okay? So, the fact that someone's a biological progenitor does not guarantee a particular quality of parenting or a particular commitment to parenting, and... But it guarantees and, meaning. <laughs> well, meaning. okay. Don't you think? Uh, yeah, but, but it's meaningful if a child has two... Uh, I, I don't think it's less meaningful if a child is uh, conceived from the egg of one woman in the uterus of another woman and calls both of them mommy and is loved and nurtured and cherished by both people. This is, you, you don't accept the social science evidence suggesting that child outcomes do not hinge materially on the gender of the parents or the sexual orientation of the parents. You believe deep down there's something special and it's just wrong to depart from that. And this, these conservatives on this brief basically say <coughs> marriage is our primary child protective institution and that's why we should let same-sex couples rear their children within marriage. So this is a, this is a disagreement and I don't think we can really, mm -hmm. re we can really settle this mm -hmm. because it's just, I mean, this is not something that let's, I'll let's, persuade you about, let's, and it's not something you'll persuade me let's, about. Let's just be, let's restate what the disagreement is. Okay. You you say simply what you think the disagreement is. Um, I think that the disagreement comes down to: is it critical to parenthood that a child has to have, as as the people parenting them, a biological father and a biological mother? Or is it is it um, is it is it um, um, okay? Is it acceptable? Is it a desirable state of affairs that a child could be nurtured by people who uh, may or may not be their genetic biological parents, but wanted that child? And, and love that child and can cherish and nurture the child, or just one biological parent wanted that child can nurture and cherish and take care of that child. I, you know, I've known affluent single mothers, the Murphy Brown types, but not Murphy, because she actually got accidentally pregnant, women who consciously wanted to have a child, they adopted a baby from China or from some other country, or they adopted a, a, a biracial child or what have you, and, and I respect those people. I don't think that they should be shamed or, or criticized or, or what have you. Um, and so, yes, I think that we have a disagreement over whether the optimal family form for children must be one biological man, sorry, one, one biological genetic father, one biological genetic mother. And it's very interesting in France that there's so much protest over the same-sex marriage law. And part of that is because there is among some of these people this deep feeling that it's just wrong. It's wrong that a child shouldn't have the mother and the father. It's wrong. Right? I think there, I think, well, first of all, thank you. Right. I think you have accurately stated it. Right. Uh, I, w I think you've accurately stated it. Um, I, I do think there was a reason why this was in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. The UN Declaration of Human Rights only grants the child three rights. 
the right to um, a, a place to live, and for, for, the, for the life of me, I'm blanking on this, a name, a name, a place to live, right. and the right, insofar as possible, to know and be cared by her own parents. Right. Of course, this was adopted pre-assisted reproductive technology. So, it, 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 yes. I think we don't have the drafters in front of us here, but I think it had more to do with war-torn countries, children displaced by war, uh, you know, terrible eugenic things, terrible uh, mm. programs of exterminating peoples. Well, and, and it I doesn't think that say that in the language. No, what it but, simply but, says but, is that the we, the people of the world, right. agree that the human child, qua human right. child, has the right to a name, yes. has the right to a place to live, yes. and has the right to know her parents. Right. All I'm trying to say is that I don't believe the drafters had in mind the notion that someday someone would have a con donor-conceived child, and we're trying to say that's wrong. Mm. Okay. I think that, yes, okay. Right. I, think I think they were more concerned about refugees and, and children separated from their parents and social experiments that somehow tried to supplant the role of parents and, and what have you. Well, let's, let's talk about marriage as a public issue today because in some ways asking you to asking you questions about how you as a philosopher are approaching some of these difficult family questions you know what's all, what's going on in my my mind is can we society come up with a fresh pro-marriage coalition? And can that coalition include Linda McLean and, and those uh, and, and many, many others uh, like, who, like her who have who, who share your values. And so my, my argument, you know, when I changed on the gay marriage issue and tried to think in recent months about this idea of a fresh pro-marriage coalition. Right. It basically comes down to, to, on the one hand, you want to have social conservatives who are pro-family enough to break bread with gays and lesbians who are also pro-family. Right. Okay? You want liberals who are in favor of marriage as a social institution even when the word gay is not in front of it. Mm -hmm. Not just pro-gay marriage, but pro-marriage. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm, that's sort of the nature of my pressing you about some of these family questions which, to put in the blurb, you co-edited a book called What is Parenthood that is just out now from NYU Press. It's a wonderful book of essays where you explore, you and your fellow authors explore exactly this uh, uh, set of questions. So I'm interested in uh, asking you how you, what you think about the possibility today of strengthening the institution of marriage with a broad coalition that involves conservatives, liberals, and gay and lesbian Americans. Okay. Well, um, until you share with me <laughs> that you're still deeply troubled about <laughs> gay parents, I would have felt better about the prospects for that coalition. But I am a little worried because um, one thing that Stop. I did not say I'm troubled about gay parents. Well, what I said was... You're troubled when they arise from an intentional decision to have children and not simply a result of prior heterosexual... But I'm no more disturbed when a homosexual person does it than I am when a heterosexual person does it. No, no. Most assisted reproductive technology today and most uh, single parenthood is... Uh, at the agency of heterosexual people, and it makes, I am, I believe those are troubling questions to me. Okay, so let me just get this straight. Regardless You're of, as troubled if 
a infertile married couple gets a donor egg and donor sperm and produces a baby as you are by two lesbians producing a baby. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, all right. So, so it's not just that the married couple would have a mother and father, it has to be the genetic, biological mother and father, if at all possible. I just, call me nuts, but I just think there's something meaningful about the fact But what if they can't reproduce? I mean, what if this, the only way this married couple is going to have, that's be able to have a child, that's the reason I you'd was allow them to adopt, the but right not to create to a, child. a child through ART? Well, I'm not in charge of running the world. Well, I know you're not. I'm just saying that in my <laughs> uh, way of thinking about it, there's something uh, meaningful about the fact that human beings are embodied right. sexually and that new human beings come into the world sexually, that we reproduce sexually, right. that this is a meaningful fact for all of us human beings walking around out there. And therefore, the fact that I came in terms of my body from a man and a woman is meaningful to me as an individual in my life journey, and it is meaningful as a social fact about all human beings. And so therefore, to efface or to deny the integrity of that fact by saying, well, it really doesn't matter, of course, then I do find it troubling, but I'm not pointing a finger okay. at gay and lesbian people. I'm, I, I'm, and I'm not trying to drive our whole discussion here based on this one point. I don't want to tell the wag the dog. I'm trying to, this is one okay. issue within a larger right. and- So let me talk a little bit about then okay. a marriage, okay? Um, so I did read the new the marriage a new conversation, and what I liked about it is blurb that too right. Call for what I like about it marriage. is that it talks about uniting gays and straights to focus on class inequality. Okay, that and was so, the main point. Right. So for anyone listening who doesn't know all about this, let me just briefly yes. state that the idea is that there is a growing marriage gap in America based on class, so that marriage increasingly is a matter of the haves, not the have-nots. And it's not simply the have-nots that are the poor, it's the middle America have-nots as well. And so the idea is that college-educated people who have means view marriage as a capstone experience. It's sort of like a sign that you've arrived. It's a sign of success. We're talking you about know, approximately 30% of the American population. Right. The big... Upscale, right. college-educated right. America. You know, and the fact that we spend... I personally didn't spend a lot on my wedding, but the fact that people spend so much on their weddings is just a symbol of all of this. And then at the same time, it, as I was saying before we went formally on the tape, it used to be that there was this notion that marriage was out of reach for poor people. They say they valued marriage, but they felt it was out of reach because they had to have certain economic prerequisites. They had to have a steady job. They had to have savings. They wouldn't have a house. They wouldn't have a dog. You know, they want to have a car. And because they didn't think they could reach those things, um, they didn't marry. And yet they wanted to be parents. So they would separate marriage from parenthood. And also there were quality issues about the relationship. They didn't trust the person they were with. They didn't think they were good marriage material. They didn't want to get married and get divorced. And so for all these reasons that Kathy Eden has written about, that Sarah McClanahan has written about, that all these fragile families researchers have documented, gender, you know, gender distrust, men and women, economic issues, there's this gap. Now the big story is... Let me, let me, is, let me yeah. just say, okay. and that, that's right. absolutely right. accurate. Okay. I just want to say, for simplicity's sake, we have about 30% college educated right. upscale where marriage trends are looking pretty solid. Right. Right. And then we have the rest of America, right. middle class, lower middle class, blue collar, and poor America where the marriage trends are tanking. Right. Marriage is disintegrating very and rapidly. And that's the new story. Is that that's it's not the new just, story. It's not just the so-called fragile families among low-income moms and dads. It's the broad middle. It's people who have a high school degree, yes. but maybe a little college, but not a four-year degree. And when we did this right. statement, right. which you are giving your views on, right. we said that the 
we need to bring together as strong a coalition as we can, which includes gay and lesbian couples right. and supporters of gay marriage, as well as m liberals and conservatives, to focus on this overwhelmingly important social fact of the disintegration of marriage for the bottom 70% of the society. Right, so then, so then it's important to look at what are the different factors contributing to this marriage gap and what are the practical things that can be done as a matter of public policy, as a matter of you know, um, civil society organizations. Well, you, you've actually anticipated my next right. question, which since it's well f developed in my mind, let me ask it to you now. Okay. President Obama right. called you into the White House. You have to skip <laughs> one of your classes. And you're sitting down having lunch with the president, and he says to you, Professor McClain, it's <clears throat> come to my attention and the attention <laughs> of my advisors that we have a very serious right. challenge out there right. because in the broad middle sectors of society, lower middle class, blue collar America, we have a disintegration of marriage, very high rates of single parent homes, lots of chaotic lives, suffering children, bad outcomes, and it's embedded in a, a trend that we are in the danger of becoming two nations. Mm -hmm. the, the haves here right. and the have-nots and the growing separation. And I am asking you to give me any wisdom that you could on what I might do about this right. or what I might encourage others to do. Right. Well, I think he, um, he should definitely learn from the considerable body of research that has already been done on fragile families, right? <laughs> the, the Sarah McClanahan research project. Just and, say briefly what that okay, is. That so that, Sarah McClanahan is at Princeton, and, and from the 90s on, they've Four, been studying yeah. low-income, black, Latina, uh, white, unmarried parents. Some of them are married, but most are unmarried. And they say, and they study their children, they ch study child diagnosis, they say, why is it that around the time of the birth of the child, most of these couples have high hopes that they're going to marry, and they're romantically involved, yes. but then few do. And, and in two years, they're right. broken up. And, and the important thing about this research, which got Congress very excited back in the early 2000s, nice. yes. because when they were going to reauthorize welfare, they thought, if only we could seize that magic the moment. magic moment. The magic moment. Right. And get those people together, you know, through marriage education or whatever. So, um, yes. and, and the problem I is, re I it's it well. not just education, it's economic problems, it's, 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 it's infrastructure. And so if you could learn... Um, when you say infrastructure... It's like the fact that people are, don't have a, a decent education, they don't have good job prospects. There's the problem of multiple partner fertility, where people have a child with one person, then they have a child with another person, and so you have a very complicated pattern where someone is actually a, a parent to many different children and not really a full-time parent to any child, yes, right? Yes, that is, would be and, a problem. And, and so back when they were trying to promote marriage among low-income people, like, well, you know, that may not work so well if they have several possible partners. So this type of, um, I want to just mention a very important new book by Catherine Eden called Doing the Best I Can, which is about, admittedly, we're not talking about the middle yet, but they're talking about low-income fathers. But you're saying one of your recommendations is, is to study President Obama what we would do be know study about low -income. the experience right. Right. of right. family formation right. and family the fragmentation. Of, right. The mixture of relationship quality issues, gender mistrust, but, but economic Linda, issues, Linda, you yes, know, okay. substance abuse problems. I'm, I'm going to play everything. President Obama right. and I'm going to say right. yes. Right. I'll read all that stuff, right. but my advisors tell me well, let's look at the middle that we then. haven't made any progress here. Um, well, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but let's look at the middle. So what can you learn from looking at the middle? You have Charles Murray's very provocative picture, you have Hannah Rosen's picture, you have uh, something you all just released uh, by David the, and Amber Lab. Right, in Ohio. Yes. You know, what's going on with these families? You know, why aren't they marrying? Why are they separating parenthood from marriage? You know, sometimes there's, there's like. There's a quantitative literature and there's an emerging right. ethnographic right. literature exactly. about this exactly. you need huge to, right. segment of our population. Right. right. 
I mean, so the, the, the practical problem is to think about the interplay of the economic issues with the kind of qualitative issues about relationships and frankly, gender conflicts. Like what, you know, if, if the woman doesn't think the man is going to contribute to anything to the household, why should she marry him? You know, if she doesn't think he's reliable or going to be faithful, why should she take a chance? See, people think marriage is, you shouldn't marry if you're going to divorce. So in a, in a way, that's nice. Like, we shouldn't get married if you're going to divorce. And, and one thing your researchers found is they don't know very many examples of successful marriages. And that so was, they avoid marriage. That was one of the but big But they don't findings. avoid having kids together. Yes. And so then this is the practical problem. And this is kind of um, cohabitation. Fact, by the way, Amber Lapp, yeah. the, one of the yeah. authors of that, is moderating tonight's discussion online uh, and with Twitter. So, yeah. uh, you mean in Ohio? Right now, to, yeah. as we speak, yeah. this conversation. Yeah. We should she's beam in them Ohio. in and get her advice. So a shout out she to should advice us. She, she should advise Obama. Us. A That's shout right. out to Amber. Send right. in a Twitter. Now, question. the first thing I would tell President Obama is I'm not a social scientist, but I'm thrilled you wanted my views. And so <laughs> I would urge you to you know, be mindful of this balance of qualitative relationship issues as well as demographic changes and economic changes because it's a huge issue. Um, you know, what do you do? Uh, to go but back Professor to William McClain, James Wilson, when I work do disappears. Should some finger pointing out here as president use the bully pulpit and just tell Well, he these, has used the bully pulpit. No, shouldn't I do it more and shouldn't I tell people that they shouldn't have children unless they're married? Okay, so one of the interesting things about... Gay or straight? But one of the interesting Don't things about your study that the labs did, that, I'm just going to finish. I'm going to say something about this. <laughs> Could we just talk a little bit about, you said a little while ago, it's extremely meaningful that a man and a woman had a sexual relationship that produced a child. The sad thing is, if you look at the circumstances in which some of these children are being conceived, it's not a particularly meaningful relationship. Your researchers talk about people getting a little crazy at a party That's and a the child point. was born. Kathy Eden's research suggests, you know, they're just hanging out. The next thing you know, someone's pregnant. They don't really know have much in common. I'm saying it's meaningful for the child. <laughs> okay. It may but the be. circumstances of conception may not have been too meaningful. For the adults doing the conceiving. Right, right. But for the child. In fact, the New York court has told us is momentary casual sex uh, too often, right? And so, and, okay, so but the point is though, it, it's really, maybe we could think about why, wh maybe we should talk about sexual ethics. Maybe we should talk about how people are finding themselves in these types of encounters where children result. They maybe didn't go in thinking they wanted to have children, and then what happens, you know? So what happens well, to Well, often child? when you do have sex, Right. Pregnancy occurs. President Obama has moralized about about responsible fatherhood. He's he he because he grew up not knowing his father. He wrote a whole book about the importance of like I was very knowing moved about his father several weeks right? ago when he was in Chicago, and he uh, gave a talk on this, and he was giving a a, a very moving series of statements about the importance of. Uh, fathers and then he paused and I don't think he was reading from the speech and he said you know I wish my father had been around right in my life you know I was I was so moved by that but one thing President Obama did say is when he looked back at dreams of my father he wished he'd said more about how grateful he was to his mother who raised him yes because there was a sense of you long for what you don't have and yes. his mother died and everything and he yes. kind of wished that when she was still alive yes. he had said a bit more about yes. how much he valued yes you know because we have had some pretty successful leaders raised by single moms yes but to yes. go back to your picture of, of what to do, it, it's a very, if it's on the magnitude of what you're describing, you know, it's a, it's a crisis. And, and it's not it going to be solved just by preaching to people, right? Um, because you have real economic change. Yes. Right? And, and here's the gender part. If, mm -hmm. if you believe Rosen's accounts, Young women are kind of trying to adapt to the new economy, are trying to better themselves, are trying to get education, to find the jobs that are available, that Rosen thinks young men are kind of stuck. They, and even middle-aged men, they, are, they don't adapt as well. I mean, I, it's a simplistic picture Rosen paints, but there are some anecdotes to flesh out the picture, and there are some other suggestions as well. Like, uh, you know, the young women are kind of trying to better themselves, to try to advance, and yet, 
young men are not, and so this creates more of a marriage gap because if people are increasingly marrying people more like them, and the woman is, is bettering herself, and the man is either unable to or unwilling to, then this is not going to make it for a good marriage. It seems to be a trend across much of society right. that women are doing better at thriving. There are there are women that are not doing better. There are a lot of class differences, but, but young women are. But don't you um, think that in general, it's, it does seem to me that we have a pretty obvious problem of many many of our our, our men are not are not doing are, are, are not doing well. Well, some of it's because of the job job loss. I mean, loss of certain types of jobs that used to pay a family wage that aren't available but anymore. See the the. As you know, well know, right. this is a right. this is a discussion that we've had before. Right. As, as you as you know, some of the um, pushback to that argument is not to say that economics doesn't matter, but to say that sometimes liberals are too quick to simply just say, "Well, it's an economic question." In other words, there are these larger trends in society having to do with the globalization and economic trends and wage rates and this and that and the other, all of which may be true, but meanwhile we still have these people making children together mm -hmm. in increasingly chaotic ways that are not good for them or their children. And it can't, so goes the critique, be entirely attributable to the job market. In other words, there's more going on than, than the economics of it. Once we agree that the economics of it is, wouldn't there be a place for people's view in their heads right. of what marriage is? And to get back to our ads, wouldn't it be, you may not like these ads, but wouldn't it be a meaningful fact to know whether or not young boys and girls in our society thought, gosh, having a child before I'm married is really a bad idea, or whether they thought, who knows, you know? In other words, it's not all the, it, I know you're not saying it is, but the feeling I sometimes have with the liberal argument that I want to embrace and recruit into a pro-marriage movement is that it, it can't just, to me, it can't just be all these larger trends and if the government will fix the job problem and if the economy will get right and if capitalism will become more fair, then everything will be better on the family front. We need, it seems to me we need to attend directly to issues of, as you say, sexual ethics, what the meaning of the marital norm is, whether or not we have a consensus about some of these questions in our society, if we have any prayer of hoping that the non-elite part of America is going to re-enter the, the, a marriage culture. So what do you do about the practical problem that um, someone um, has economic prospects that don't look great, right? Um, they're not impoverished, but they don't, they're not lives of great privilege or affluence or what have you. They're, let's say they're working class, uh, they're doing the best they can. Well, you're describing the overwhelming and, number of and, Americans throughout history. Okay, and so I guess your bottom line would be it's wrong for them to have a child outside of marriage even if they don't see a plausible marriage partner, but they very, very strongly want to be a parent. Let's it's, not talk about chaos right now. Let's not talk about the chaotic going overboard I would party. say it's wrong. I would say it's okay. wrong, yes. And, and I don't mean to sound like, you know, I believe that it is not a good strategy for social change right. to hector and punish and you know, make people, tell people they're bad. I know that is not a good strategy, but what I do feel is that as a society, including prestigious law professors who have, cr 
credibility as, a, as leading liberal and feminist thinkers should say, look, there, we need to become clearer about family formation norms than we are now. And the, uh, the ideas of marriage precedes becoming a parent, and marriage has uh, integrity as an institution and needs to be respected rather than being trashed, is part of the solution that liberal and feminist leaders, along with others, can broadly speaking, embrace. Well, I just want to go back a second to um, the idea of what would the agenda be yeah. to, to address the marriage gap. Because to the extent that middle, middle, middle America is saying, I value marriage, I aspire to marriage, but it's out of reach. You know, what do you do about that? What, what do you do in terms of programmatic policy to deal with the fact? Now, you could say, I know one thing your movement's trying to do is say, why do you think it's out of reach? I mean, why do you think marriage has to be a capstone experience? I mean, you don't and have to have a $50,000 wedding, you know? I mean, I think my wedding cost about $1,000, you know? I mean, you don't have to... That's about how much ours weighed you know? in that, too. Um, <laughs> so, so, so one thing is to challenge the notion that you have to be at this level in order to marry. And I know part of what you're trying to do is explain to people that you could actually better your situation. But the problem is if they think the potential marriage partner is not going to help make their lives better, it may just be a net drain on their lives then who are they going to marry? Can, when you have a social trend that we no, no longer live in a world where bosses are marrying secretaries and people are marrying greatly against across class lines, but instead people are marrying, it's called assorted and mating. As you know, they're marrying similarly situated people. And, and if the people that are potential marriage partners do not look attractive to them, the problem, though, is people aren't stopping from having children just because they can't find the right marriage partner. Well, that has, that and has, that has to do, come to my attention. Right. Yes. That has to do with a couple things. One is, so in some instances, in Kathy Eden's work shows this, they actually believe they can be competent parents without a, a, a married partner, and they think that is one thing they can do well, even if they can't have the ideal marriage. You know, about right? 10 or 12 years ago, I was invited into a school it was actually in Ohio. This is an all-white school, not that it matters, but I'm just trying sociologically, two garages, two cars in every garage, middle-class America. They had like 30 or 40 percent of the, of the kids graduating from this high school class were either pregnant or had impregnated someone. There's a huge number, and they brought me in. Talk about a bad idea. What in the world was I going to say? So I'm this white guy. I get up and say, well, you know, marriage and proper behavior. This very attractive young girl gets up, middle, first questioner. She says, I'm a single mother, and I have the support of my teachers and my classmates, and my baby gets everything he needs from me. Mm -hmm. And an ovation occurred. <laughs> okay. The other students and the teachers, you know, it was one of those tear up moments. <laughs> Go, girl, this proud, self confident young woman. My baby gets everything he needs from me. Yeah. My heart sank like a stone. And I was so tongue tied. And I said something that I'm sure made her angry, that I thought maybe one day she might even see herself that her baby was not going to get everything he needed from her. And I'm sure she thought that was a pretty piss poor answer to that question. And in the spirit of the thing, she was being supported by her friends and peers and so forth. But what's wrong with that picture? Um, I thought about something you said about high school because in my class I teach on feminist legal theory. We do a unit on, um, on contraception and sexual responsibility and many of the students had gone to Catholic schools. And 
one was reporting a very alarming rate of teen pregnancy among the Catholic schoolgirls. And, and I know you don't want to change the subject, but we do need to talk about what's our approach to sex education and relationship education with young people. As you know, during the, Bush no, during the Clinton administration, Congress passes a welfare bill funding abstinence only until marriage education where you're not even allowed to mention contraception unless you say it fails. All right, I've okay. got, I've got but, jobs on the agenda and I've got no, sex no, 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 on the agenda. No, 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 but there's a reason here. So, okay. so if you're trying to teach sexual responsibility, you can have a strong message of abstinence, but for heaven's sakes, do you want to teach them crazy nonsense about how <laughs> condoms are actually dangerous, you know, you have, you're just not going to work, and the only possibility is total abstinence? And, and if you have this big gap between puberty and age of marriage, what do you do for that 10 or 15 you. year gap? And so for a long time, our public policy was dominated by this abstinence only until marriage ideology. Bristol Palin's pregnancy becomes this huge brouhaha. You know, uh, her mother's a big supporter of abstinence only sex education. That. Now she's championing not becoming a teen mom, right? But, but so we do have to look at what do you do, um, you know, what, how do you teach teenagers to, you know, be sexually and responsible and you know you can preach an abstinence message but are you going to tell them nothing about mm. how to protect themselves if they do become okay. sexually active I, I and you. and that is you want to go back to the teenagers did all these teenage girls set out to become pregnant or did they become pregnant accidentally i mean a lot of times what happens is people are insufficiently motivated to avoid becoming it pregnant. It seems to be... Or they don't, you know, there's yeah. a stigma about using contraception in a yeah. serious relationship. Yeah. Okay, let's um, open it up for a couple of okay. questions. <laughs> now that we've totally resolved all our now that Now that we've worked out President Obama's agenda entirely, somebody want to ask something? Oh, and, and, and we might also learn, he might also learn from other countries. Like, what could we learn from looking around to see what other countries are doing on some of these issues? All right. Yes? Well, a couple of things. I wanna, uh, struck me is I, I think uh, there are other questions about not just does a child uh, need a mother and father but does a child maybe need two parents I mean can it just be a logistical question of one parent will obviously be more stretched than than two adult human beings right. regardless of their gender I'm a little surprised it didn't come up in the interplay as, as one of the discussions um, mm. but I think what strikes me about this predicament is it, it seems like the job situation of course and I'm sure is contributing but I think a lot of it goes down to structure in in child rearing structure in development of people and it seems like our biggest problem is with the technological changes with the social changes with the pace of society the way it is it seems that and as, as someone who's an educator has worked with a lot of different school populations, it, it's, well, I'm not asking this enough as a question, but obviously I want the response. It seems like the more professional class have figured out how to continue structure or how to renew structure within the, the larger it's, it's social environment. It's kind of what I was getting at when I was asking Linda uh, about, she thought, I, I think you thought I was trying to kind of call you a name or something, but when I was asking about progressive politically and temperamentally conservative, I was a little bit at getting at this point about there, there is something going on among a significant group of Americans who are doing very well and who may often have some of the same political values, and not always, but many that you've described. But but you, you used words like control, structure. I said temperamentally conservative. I just mean um, just kind of conventional bourgeois attitudes about daily, about life. It, and it does seem to me that David and Amber did not find those attitudes of in their research, whereas I think you and I and many others 
strive to embody them in our lives, whether we call ourselves liberals or conservatives politically. That's the kind of point Well, I think this is sort of the red states, blue states paradox, the red families versus blue families that June Carbone and Naomi Khan have yeah. talked about, that in areas where, you know, there's actually more um, adherence, or lip service given anyway, or embrace of traditional values and more conservative, rates of teen pregnancy, rates of divorce are actually higher. And then in the blue states, like Massachusetts, uh, that are more politically liberal, divorce rates are lower, rates of non-marital births are lower. And, and so what, what accounts for that? One thing Judah Naomi suggested is it's not like um, people set out to say, okay, here's my game plan. I know I shouldn't have a child until I get married, but they're investing in their education, they're investing in themselves, they tend to put these things off until they've reached a certain level, and then they marry someone of a similar level, and they have their children primarily within, if they're I able mean, to, within gracious, a marital Goodness gracious, Linda, form. you know the statistics. Right. Uh, if you are a woman right. who has graduated from right. a four-year college, right. the chances that you are going to have a child outside of marriage currently stand at about... Six percent. Yes, I think it's if higher. It's are, higher for black women, though, right? Even if they have a college degree, because yeah, rates of marriage are lower. Yes, it is. Right, right. But if you look then to for high school graduates, but not right. four-year right. college, right? Forty-four percent. Right. This is an astonishing. So you said tend not to. Yes, tend not to, right. down to like right. very, very low numbers for th for these upscale uh, couples. Right, right. Very right. low numbers. So in a way, they don't need the kind of, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't even pretend to know what's going on here. I've never liked that blue state, red state business because it seems too political for my taste. But there's some, I will concede that there does seem to be something going on in our class structure along these lines. I, something. I don't quite know what it is. That's why I was asking before about, because you know the old idea was, maybe you never accepted it, but the old idea among many people was liberal politics was connected to kind of family not being tightly you know, and that's not true. Well, I think it was part of questioning tradition, question yeah. authority, yeah. you know, throw off old conventions. And, and certainly um, part of the feminist revolution was trying to challenge a particular vision of how family life had to take place. Not necessarily um, the single mother part, but certainly the sex inequality within the household, which has led to some of the, you know, reformation I mean, I, of I family. Think I'm learning this in the gay, the gay marriage uh, issue. I, I recently went down to a church here in New York, St. Luke's in the Fields. Most of the members there are gay or lesbians, you know, and um, so I was just curious to find out what is happening in this community now that marriage is a legal right, right. for these congregants, mm -hmm. whereas it had not been about five minutes ago a legal right. And what's happening is, well, first of all, a lot of them are getting married. And second of all, they seem to be taking it very seriously. And and it's this high form, you know, it's this, in other words, so I think what's happening, despite some fears that, well, okay, the gay is what's going to kind of mess around with marriage, I feel that's happening, marriage is going to mess around with gay, you know? Right. In other words, these are couples who had, for not for had been on the kind of outside of things now getting married and participating in this institution and I was was so moving to hear you know and so again it's I don't I didn't ask them about their politics but I'm, I'm again I'm getting this idea that okay pro gay <laughs> pro gay marriage you know and but the it's not about the rejection of the institution, it's not about the rejection of structure, it's not about the rejection of, you know, confirm thy soul and self-control, it's about right. embracing right. all those well, things. Well, so here's a funny thing that's <laughs> happened as a result of the litigation 
and the efforts in, 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 in legislative bodies to promote marriage equality. You can, I teach family law, right? So you will find encomiums to marriage. You will find wonderful prose about how vital marriage is, how fundamental it is, how we cherish it. It's so important. You could put like a huge string site together of all the spectacular statements Biggest about why marriage matters. Biggest cheerleaders for marriage in America. Right. And that's why it, it, that is why it's so vital to be admitted to that institution. Yes. So I've never bought the argument that gays were going to ruin marriage. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I hear you saying, too, that this doesn't make sense to you. But the, the, but, the, but the disconnect is, well, we have these forum in which, which were waxing rhapsodically about why marriage is so important. Then you have the so-called marriage gap, where for so many other people, marriage is just not happening. And that's the kind of challenge that's to hold this, both, both parts that of that together. That together. is the you know? ch intellectual leadership challenge of our time mm -hmm. to, 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 to wrestle with that fact. And, and I do believe, as you s said, I do believe it is a crisis because the numbers are so large. And as we welcome a small number of our fellow citizens into the institution, a lot are just mass exodus. And it's perpetuating a class divide. Not just, not just reflecting a class divide, but I think actually contributing to it, to driving it. And I, I think it's the big, um, the big to me it's the, it's the main question to wrestle with on the topic of marriage. So a part of the problem is cultural expectations about what you have to have to marry have gotten so high that people can say, oh, yes, of course I want to marry, but it's so out of reach, and it may always be out of reach, then what what do you do about that? Do you start to talk about, well, you know, there are some benefits to marriage. Um, I mean, first of all, we have to understand, in some instances, these are partners who are not good marriage prospects. There's substance abuse, there's domestic violence, there's infidelity, there's reasons that these are not, this is not going to be a good marriage. Children but, from previous relationships. Right, but, 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 putting, but if we could put all of that <laughs> to the side for a minute and just say, we love each other, we, we've been faithful, but oh, well, we're never going to have that house in the suburbs with a white picket fence and the dog and the car. Is there some conversation to have about, well, you know, maybe you don't have to have all those things in order to marry. You would think, you could because Pooling resources and, you know, you'll get by and, you yes. know, so, so part, one thing is, and I'm, again, you need someone who's not, like, you need like a, a social scientist or something to kind of help you with this. Examine those claims about what you really need and think about is there maybe, is this part of the culture pushing an expectation that, that's not helping anybody? And, and maybe we could start to go back to say, you know, marriage you do when you're just starting out. See, because if marriage is a capstone experience, it, it may always be out of reach for certain people, but it may be eminently reachable for people that have the right yeah. education. And Did the you right marry income. when you were young? 33. I was about that age right. when I married. So we followed the pattern of the college educated. Right. My marriage. mother married when she was 18. Okay. Uh, my grandma married when she was 27. Yeah. I married when I was uh, 33. Yeah. And I, I never set out to be a single parent. Having lived through my parents' divorce and all the challenges, I was very leery of whether I wanted to get married and have children. Mm -hmm. I could only get married and have children if I believed I was marrying a responsible person and you've met Jim you know he's extremely responsible and this was critical to me to be well, able to make that commitment. You lucked out and you know? I'll say so did he so it's <laughs> right. wonderful to have you and, here. And, We're out um, of time. I've been married over 20 years. There, so. all, right. all right. Wonderful to have you Thank here. You, Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you everybody.